Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kaleido LA. Thank you for joining us for the Department of Art and Art History speaker series called Kaleido LA. I'm Karen Rapp, director of LMU's LaBand Art Gallery, and I'm speaking from the campus of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, where I want to respectfully acknowledge LMU's presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. This fall, I have had the privilege to guest curate the Kaleido LA series. And in doing so, I have curatorially centered artists whose artwork and lived experiences foreground issues of social, economic, and racial justice. All artists in this series identify as BIPOC, an acronym that stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color and several artists belong to LGBTQ communities. I also want to welcome students from Art 110 and encourage you and all audience members to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to ask questions or to make comments. Your questions will be read aloud by Molly Corey, the LeBan's gallery manager, at the end of the artist's presentation, and your comments will be given to the artist. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be archived on YouTube with a link available on the Kaleido LA website. It gives me great pleasure today to welcome George Rodriguez to Kaleido LA. George's biography crisscrosses the United States. He was born and raised in the US-Mexico border city, El Paso, Texas. When he began his bachelor's degree in art at the University of Texas, El Paso, he had a focus in graphic design, but he changed his major to ceramics with a minor in painting, and he graduated in 2007. George relocated to the Pacific Northwest to continue his studies and received his MFA in ceramics from the University of Washington, Seattle in 2009. He was mentored there by acclaimed artists, Akio Takamori and Patty Warashina. In fall 2019, George relocated again to Philadelphia, where he started a position as adjunct professor and artist in residence at Tyler School of Art and Architecture at Temple University. George joins us today from Philadelphia. He has had solo shows at museums and galleries, including the Bainbridge Museum of Art in Washington State, the Halley Ford Museum in Salem, Oregon, the Rubin Center at the University of Texas, El Paso, and Foster White Gallery in Seattle. Last week, he had an opening at the Clay Studio in Philadelphia. In 2019, he was awarded the Emerging Artist Award by the National Council on Education for the Ceramic Arts. This is known as NSICA. And in 2016, he was awarded another Emerging Artist Award by the Museum of Northwest Art in Washington. That award is called the Mona Luminaries Patty Warshina Award. George refers to himself as a sculptor who makes decorative ceramic figurative sculpture. He works in series, producing themed work with titles like Urban Guardians, Sanctuary, and George, as well as in ceramic installations and in public art. What drew me to invite George to this series is the aesthetic richness of his artwork. His monumental figures are adorned with embellished surfaces that are made up of tactile, colorful patterns. His decorations, though, go beyond the surface because by researching artwork from different time periods and different cultures from around the world, George celebrates his own Latinx identity as well as diversity in art and in life. In his work, he creates a visual language that is made up of many vocabularies. He sees commonalities across the world between our cultures, 
and his artwork exalts the linkages between, for example, patterning in Thai architecture and Peruvian artifacts. George speaks about our shared humanity and he extends his observations about art to people. I quote him, we are stronger as individuals when we can lean on the understanding of our differences. I want to understand my neighbors and place them on a pedestal." End quote. George, welcome to Los Angeles today and to LMU. Thank you for joining us, everyone, for Kaleido LA. George, I invite you to turn on your video camera and microphone and come to the virtual podium. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, thank you, thank you so much, Karen. Uh, what a lovely, what a lovely introduction. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm very happy to be part of this series um, alongside so many other great artists that um, have spoken and will uh, speak in this platform. Um, and again, I really appreciate the opportunity to just share my my work and my life with you. So, um, <clears throat> Karen did such a wonderful job uh, <laughs> telling you about me, and I'm just going to elaborate on some of those um, some of those themes. So, um, I grew up in El Paso, Texas, and um, you know I grew up in a very wonderful community and culture, uh, binational. So my family was on both sides of the border. Uh, my sisters and my mother, and I were you know in the in El Paso in the Texas side, uh, but I had uncles and cousins that were in Juarez, Mexico. So I always uh, start with an image of my family just because they've supported me so much and especially going into um, or pursuing a career in art. Um, it takes a lot of support in order to to make it. So I'm very thankful to them, my sisters and my mother and my aunts and everybody that really kind of rallied behind me. So. As Karen mentioned, I went to the University of Texas in El Paso, UTEP, <clears throat> and it's this wonderful university nestled in the Franklin Mountains. And I went in with the intention of trying to get a, uh, or pursue an art degree, but also I needed to get a job. So I went in for graphic design. Mm -hmm. It wasn't my jam. So I took, luckily, introductory painting and metals and sculpture and ceramics. And I actually took ceramics first, just because I wanted to get it out of the way. Um, and this is one of the first pieces in my intro to ceramics class. I found out you can do more than pottery, which at that point I wasn't as interested in. Um, and this is a, a self-portrait from 2004. <clears throat> I look a little bit different now. Uh, Vince Burke was my professor and my mentor. He really taught me a lot and opened uh, doors up wide for me to uh, walk through. And to this day, I can say he's a really great friend. Uh, he still teaches at UTEP. So, um, you know, I share this undergraduate work because I, you know, learned how to make molds. So this is a series of 15 figures. Again, they're self-portraits. So a theme that I kind of carried throughout was I don't really know art at that point in my life. So um, I need to present the things that I know. And the only thing that I felt confident in is trying to present my own image. And that's because I thought, well, people can't tell me that I'm doing it wrong uh, because it's me. And you know, I should be able to know myself better than uh, anybody else. So this is a series of 15 figures and they teach you how to dance the uh, Macarena from start to finish. So it's a step-by-step tutorial. Um, I did make a minor in painting. So this is one of the paintings. And for me, a lot of the self-portraiture was about uh, trying to figure out what I'm doing uh, and where I'm going. So this painting was me as a mama duck kind of guiding my career choices. Like I can join the military. I was working at a shoe shop. So it's like I can continue this type of work. Uh, I can be an accountant, like what do I do um, in my career? So the mama duck is me as an artist kind of like front. 
Uh, and Sika is a national council on the education of ceramic arts. And I went to my very first in in 2005 in Baltimore. And that's the first time that I saw artists that I really admired that I had seen in books and in pictures. Um, and I went and I met these people uh, face to face. So it was like an amazing experience. <clears throat> so I came back from in and I created this self portrait where I, it's me wearing a suit of all the memories that I experienced from Baltimore. It was also one of the very first times that I traveled outside of El Paso. So um, after like several years of wondering what I was going to do, I decided to focus on clay as a degree. Um, and when I decided that, I also thought I need to surround myself with people that, um, whose work I love. So I made this uh, piece called Ring Around the Rosie, where it's me and four other artists that I really admired. Um, and they're all figurative artists. They make really cool, funky figures. Um, and we're all holding hands, playing Ring Around the Rosie. So it's uh, Akio Takamori, Sergei Izipov, Lisa Clegg, and Tom Bartel, whose work I still like really enjoy to this day. And then my thesis work, um, from my undergrad studies was this series of 16 figures placed outdoors. And I'm starting to think a little bit about um, how the community interacts with my work and how I want people that aren't necessarily walking into the gallery to encounter art. So, you know, public artwork. Um, and how do I fit into that, uh, fit into that world? So I made this playground with these uh, 16 figures where the community are, uh, our viewers to this experience that's happening before them. I went to Seattle, very different than El Paso. Um, Seattle is overcast gray and very uh, green and wet. And El Paso is high desert, very dry, uh, very brown. Um, and I went specifically to study at the University of Washington and more specifically to study with this uh, gem of a human, Akio Takamori. Um, so I love Akio's work. He was a great mentor as well, great human. So I wanted to study with people that I admired. And uh, then I discovered the work of Doug Jack, who's another amazing figurative sculptor. And then the trio professors at, in the ceramics department uh, was kind of solidified with Jamie Walker, um, who was really the glue of the program. <clears throat> And I also want to just, um, you know, shout out John Taylor, who was a tech of the ceramics department. So the tech in any art school, like really keeps the spaces running and moving. So um, sometimes they don't get as much love as they uh, deserve, but they deserve like all the love. Um, and for me, you know, it's also important to just shout out the people that helped guide me along the way because it really has been a journey that I haven't done on my own. It takes a lot of support uh, from people. Um, Seattle's a time when I started this like idea of ornamentation and embellishment. So really kind of like working on the surface. <clears throat> and I started that because I first like I wanted to take advantage of the facilities. So I they had a big kiln. I thought, okay, I'm going to make a big figure to fill that kiln. So this is one of the first pieces from graduate school. And as I was making the matador, I wanted a way to mimic the embroidery of this like costume, this really wonderful decoration. So I thought uh, sprigging, so applying these like really shallow relief to the surface. So this is the sprig ornamentation on the matador. Um, with a little bit of gold luster and some fabric work <clears throat> and the Chicago Bulls because I'm a, you know, a child of the 90s basically. Uh, and then this is a little bit of that process. So I'll show you process images throughout this presentation just so that you can see how some of the work is uh, created. And most of the time when I uh, delve into like 3D work, uh, I always like to explore it in 2D as well. So there's some like, you know, negation of gravity or composition. I can include a crowd. I can include other elements of the environment in 2D uh, that might be more difficult in three dimensions. So I like to try and toggle between 
both of those, this is a little uh, pop-up print. And then um, upon graduating from UW, University of Washington, uh, we put on a thesis show. So this was my, uh, my uh, work in the group exhibition. And I'll just go rather quickly through some of the building process. So I, you know, get my slabs of clay, make my sprig decoration. And at this point I thought, I'm gonna build all nine or eight figures at the same time. So I set out this template I'm kind of covering and working on the uh, on the sculptures as I'm you know as I'm moving. You can tell that, like the matador, the hands and arms were built separate just for structural stability. I always say that if you want to build large work, you need to be a nice person. I mean, you should be a nice person regardless. But um, I ask for a lot of help because. I can't physically move the pieces by myself. So uh, this is Shelby Stewart and Jacob Poran helping me. They were graduate students at the time. Um, and then also just like working in ceramics and working in clay, there's a lot of failure in the material, right? Sometimes things break and crack. And in this case, it broke before we even got it into the kiln. Um, so the story goes that I built eight of these figures and I actually couldn't get them into the kiln without them falling apart. So one night I went in, uh, smashed them all, and then started to build three at a time. So I built them twice in a way. Um, and this is a work uh, the second time with, uh, without the arms. This um, are the heads that would eventually fit into those bodies. And then this is the heads with uh, glaze and the boots that I thought would balance those, uh, you know, 250, almost 300 pound bodies, <clears throat> which didn't quite work out. Sometimes I'm very optimistic. Um, so the piece eventually came together. You can see there's little braces on the bottom that are steel that are actually holding the pieces in place. And for me, this body of work, um, after two years of living in Seattle, coming from El Paso, this body of work was about community and trying to find um, and interact with community. So people asked me if it was about the border um, and I never saw it that way until somebody pointed that out for me. But um, it's about just like trying to enter, uh, you know, a different community. And I missed, uh, I missed El Paso, I missed hearing Spanish um, everywhere. So my thoughts were, if you stand behind the piece, which was the first view that you would get, you knew that something was going on in the other side and you could always stand behind it and wonder, or you could walk around, look from the edges and see the culture and community, but you can still be in the peripheries and just look, or you could be vulnerable and step inside and be, you know, like surrounded and enveloped by it. So that was my idea behind this work, trying to get people to like step into uh, the communal space. And uh, the 2D prints that I kind of like go, go through making. <clears throat> also throughout, um, throughout my studies, like one of the shows was a group show and then I had my solo show um, also at UW. So I never had a quinceanera. My four older sisters had quinceaneras and I would always show up. Um, I was a chambelan, which is like the accompaniment to a quinceanera, um, but I never had my own as a male and I wanted a quinceanera. So I made the bell of the ball and my thesis exit show was like my uh, introduction into the art world per se. So um, this is my, uh, what I thought of as my quinceanera. Um, I had the wonderful opportunity to travel uh, for a year, um, thanks to a grant from the University of Washington, the Bonderman Travel Fellowship. And um, these few images are going to look like a weird like travel um, diary, but <clears throat> the opportunity to just like look at all these places around the world that I never imagined I could visit um, really transformed and changed my life. The, um, the idea of like how small the world really is uh, was imprinted and also just like how friendly 
and open people from all over the world are. And I know there were no people depicted in those images, but um, the people I encountered were, you know, the best part of, of that travel experience. And also this photo, which is just like probably the most magical thing I ever uh, experienced where there's a rainbow and a monkey and a parrot and it's just like in the jungle. Ugh, it was, it was really, it was heaven. Um, but that like travel, um, I was a sponge and I was just absorbing and absorbing and absorbing. Uh, and I came back to the States really confused because I was absorbing so much. I didn't have a time to digest. So um, I was lucky to land at Pottery Nose West, which is a residency program where if you're in a transitional point, um, they gave me space to work and facilities to do so. So I spent two years at Pottery Northwest working. Um, and when I left Pottery Northwest, I was thinking, how do I, uh, what's the culmination of my time here? And I thought about this uh, James Frazier sculpture, End of the Trail. But more specifically, I thought of this version, which I saw first, which is the Luis Jimenez version, version of the sculpture, End of the Trail with Electric Sunset. And Luis Jimenez is an artist that was born in El Paso in my hometown. Um, and I looked at him as a, as a symbol that you can make it in the art world. So having that representation was so wonderful. This specific sculpture was in the library at UTEP. So I would go and visit the sculpture uh, fairly often. And I wanted to make my own version of the end of the trail sculpture. So I started off by doing these small mock-ups in clay. Um, the first one, I'm kind of riding a horse um, and or a donkey. And then the second one, it changed to a toy horse. And then the third version changed to a sawhorse after that with this nice um, sunrise behind me. And then the fourth version turned into a bench with like a hobo stick um, or like a bindle bag. Uh, maybe hobo stick is not the right, right wording. So bindle bag. Um, and I ended up settling on um, version number three. I started to create that sculpture. And this is at Pottery Northwest in my small uh, studio. And this is a eventual um, result of that sculpture. This is um, electric, end of the trail with electric sunrise. And I chose sunrise instead of sunset to um, hopefully have a little bit of hope. You know, the beginning of a new day, I finished that uh, two year chapter, but I was moving into the new, uh, the new stage. And that's the background of the piece with this embellishment and the painting of this um, sunrise. <clears throat> I was really fortunate to um, land in a group show at Foster White Gallery that then allowed me to be represented by this uh, gallery. So we had a wonderful conversation before I accepted uh, representation with them. Um, and this was back in 2010 when I was traveling, I was in the group show. And in 2011, when I returned, I had my first solo show. And I was really kind of like scared. I didn't know what to do. Um, I was confused. So I reverted back to where I started, right? In undergrad, I made self-portraiture and I thought, okay, um, I'm just gonna start by talking about myself. So I made The George Show. Um, and that was my first solo show at Foster White Gallery. And I'm trying to marry um, my love for embellishment and decoration uh, with you know, uh, narratives through self-portraiture. So this is me with flowers. <clears throat> And then I also thought about uh, the word tokayo, which tokayo means uh, your namesake, somebody that shares your, your name. So I thought about other Georges and how I could, you know, relate to other Georges and what we had in common. So then I turned my image, they all started with my face first, and then they switched to George Washington. And I could do some exploration and some symbolism in the type of embellishment that I had. So this is where I really started to do more research into uh, historical figures and um, popular culture figures, etc. So then that resulted in uh, the creation of uh, Boy George and Curious George and George Orr, who was the Mad Potter of Biloxi. And I had a lot of fun just like researching and figuring out what kind of decoration these figures would carry for themselves. And the 2D version of that was a silk screen of my face with drawing of 
uh, the people or the characters that I uh, created superimposed on my face. So if you see the silver and the gold in the background, that's a silkscreen of my image. Um, this is also a way that I learned uh, Robert Arneson, who taught at Davis, um, worked for a long time. He had these molds, he had his image, and then he would transform those into uh, different orientations. So it was also my nod to Robert Arneson, who's an artist who I really looked up to and admired. Um, never met him, but I loved his work. So I typically work in series and bodies of work. Um, this is the in costume. So after George came in costume, people asked me if I was a narcissist because I just kept, you know, putting my face on everything. Uh, so I thought, I'll try and make a show where my face isn't there, but there's still self portraits in a way. And I thought about these beautiful costumes that I saw as I was traveling. So these are, um, this is a procession in Puno, Peru. It's for the Virgen de Candelaria, which I believe happens in, um, when was this? In sometime in January. Um, so I started to create uh, these self portraits through just like dress forms. And I chose the dress because my mother is a seamstress. She made all of my sister's quinceanera dresses. Um, I always loved how beautifully decorated all those dresses were. So I wanted to make some forms for myself. Um, and the one on the far right is uh, Narcissus, which is a daffodil. So I wanted to, you know, address people calling me that and like represent that via these flowers that I was working with. There's also a mirror on the inside. So if you look in the dress, you catch your own reflection, which then um, ties into the myth of narcissists and like looking at your own reflection in a body of water. Airy has, um, re is referencing papel picado, which is Mexican cut paper. And it has all this floral design from the Northwest. So all these flowers that I encountered living in Seattle, but in the back, which you can't really see in the image is uh, an image of the Southwest where I grew up. So I'm trying to like express my two homes at this point. <clears throat> and it was just really fun exploring and playing with form uh, and, you know, really searching for these ideas. I had the extrovert and then I wanted to like move all the decoration to the inside and uh, present this as uh, like the introverted version of that. And then again, moving to like the 2D. So these are some photographs that I manipulated and that's me. And then um, I'm wearing all of these costumes, all of these dresses that I decided to, uh, to make. So I'm trying to like fit them. And for me, I knew what the shape of the, of the dresses were. So then I had to like find what kind of personality I wanted to embody when I wore them. <clears throat> so there's been a lot of different bodies of work here after is um, where I start thinking more about community coming together and faith and death. Um, and specifically, I was looking at these roadside altars and how, um, you know, we create these not only to commemorate the life of somebody who has passed, but also to present to our community that um, they were loved and they were important. So it's so much more for the living in my opinion, than for the person that has moved on. So I wanted to create these markers that people could come around and congregate. Um, and I decided to call them offerings. So you would give this offering and then people could know that you placed an offering uh, for something or for someone. Um, and I'm also playing with the idea of these like sugar skulls and how death is represented through this, like, you know, the skeletal figure which got me thinking about um, Posada's work, which I really love and has been an image like ingrained in my mind since I can remember. Um, so I tried my hand at making a, um, so I tried my hand at making a Posada sculpture um, and keeping that, you know, that black and white uh, newsprint quality. Um, and this is just kind of an exploration of that, of that skull work. <clears throat> so, as I, you know, move through the series of works, um, I'm looking at how, you know, how did traveling affect my work? Like, I know it has, but I wasn't able to place it. 
And this is the first time that I can see this like merging of my travel experience. This is four, four years after I traveled, I believe. Um, and it's finally like starting to emerge and come out. So I've created these figures that are not me at all, but they're an amalgamation of uh, these different cultures coming together. And I'm looking at architectural elements like gargoyles um, and relief, and then trying to figure out how does my work incorporate into that. Um, looking at Olmec heads and loving that imagery and trying to create my own like totem, totems and statuary. So this is, uh, you know, at Foster White Gallery for the Beneath the Surface. And as Karen mentioned, um, bridging these types of images that I've seen in many places. So um, the Hanuman in Bangkok with these demons from the procession in Puno and how they look so similar. So trying to think of guardians and how um, they can cross cultures. Um, so this is my representation of the Hanuman, but then also like a guardian from my culture, which is in Santo, the luchador. This is, um, Eastern and Western lion sculptures, which, you know, protect temples and state houses and uh, places of sanctity. Um, and I wanted to bridge those two aesthetics together and create my own version. So a lot of the aesthetics are similar, um, or a lot of the, the meaning behind these sculptures are similar, even though the aesthetics change between the representations. So this is just a little bit of that process of, of making the work um, and more like totems for that. This is a Maneki Neko from Japan. <clears throat> so you can see the way that they're, they're created. So we're getting into like more recent work and uh, a lot of the forms that I've been working with are based around these statuary from Tetihuacan uh, in central Mexico. Um, which are really simple, beautiful sculptures. And when I first saw them, um, they felt like companions to me. So I made the companion series where I just started to ornament and uh, bring these pieces like into my aesthetic. And then in 2016, um, after the election, I started to create a series of work that I call the Sanctuary Series. So I first started with the self-portrait uh, pieces. So this is uh, State of the Union, where I'm really depicting in my own image um, how I was feeling after the 2016 election. So um, anger and uh, a little despair and sadness. So this is kind of the red, white, and blue of my emotional well-being in 2016. But then looking at these like the Tijuacan uh, sculptures, <clears throat> a lot of my community was uh, being marginalized and kind of vilified in a way that um, nobody should nobody should feel. So I started to create the sanctuary uh, figures, and these are larger figures that um, represent me in this case. So this is a one self portrait of the bunch where I'm addressing my Mexican American identity. So this is uh, you know me with my heart over my hand over my heart for the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, and then I started to look into communities that I don't necessarily belong to, but again, that were being marginalized and vilified. Um, so uh, it was also a chance for me to empathize and find how can I best represent uh, communities that I don't belong to, but that need to be placed on a pedestal. So in hijab, um, I was looking at a lot of Islamic title and that was represented through the uh, patterning on the on the dress of the figure. Uh, Indígena is looking at indigenous cultures and um, both with you know, the colonization of some of these cultures. So they had this campesino um, kind of European dress, but still with this indigenous uh, roots um, as a backdrop. <clears throat> the debutante was talking about um, beauty standards and who gets to decide and how they change over time. So the, you know, debutante ball is very specific, but um, that's only a small subsection of, um, of what people define as beauty. 
Um, and then I kind of just moved through a few different figures, um, hands up, talking about uh, black males specifically and black community and kind of the, the perceived threat that some people feel with, um, you know, when they see a black male. Um, and Venus, again, talking about the mother figure and so forth. So uh, this was a very like heavy uh, series for me to just try and like, figure out and empathize and um, represent in a way that wasn't, um, I don't know, that just felt sincere and not uh, objectifying in a, in a crude way. So I had the chance to present this work in my hometown and I created uh, an Uncle Sam and a Tia Katrina. And for me, they were the represent representation of the border. So um, they were both equal, but very different. So that's how I feel about Mexico, um, US in regards to the border. It's very different, but it's also, you know, we lived in a community that was very equal. And when I went to El Paso to present this work, El Paso has a big military base. So I made uh, Battle Ready, which was talking about trans rights in the military and uh, my dreamer figure. And probably one of the best things that came out of uh, that show was the fact that I had the opportunity to work with the student body at UTEP and, and go back to the place where I started and uh, you know feel like I'm giving back to a community. I'll tell you that I felt like I had a little imposter syndrome when I first walked in, but then it just like felt comfortable and we all spoke the same language. Um, <clears throat> so, this is an altar that I created with Pottery Northwest, um, and we fired this piece out in a lot. Um, people were encouraged to write their hopes and dreams, and then when the piece got hot enough, we opened this kiln, and then everybody tossed their hopes and dreams, and they uh, you know, caught on fire as soon as they touched the work, and we sent these out into the world. So um, this isn't the exact piece that was in the kiln because I had to remake some spots, but this is a rendition of that altar. Um, and for me, this signifies a, a community coming together. Um, and the crown is the people, but the crown only stands um, high and is so presented when the foundation is so uh, stable. So foundation of uh, faith and death and animal instincts and kind of the earth, which is all below this like community of people. And um, I just want to say I'm so grateful because the University of Texas El Paso UTEP uh, placed this work in one of their new buildings. So, um, you know, as I admired Luis Jimenez's piece at the UTEP library, um, now I feel so fortunate to have my work um, in a similar space. And I would say like that other work was so heavy for me. So then I moved into making uh, these pieces that felt a little bit lighter. So this is a portrait of my partner, Marisol. Um, and more specifically, this is a portrait of uh, Princess Mildred, who you can see there. Uh, that's Marisol's clown. And the queen is a lion that is a representation of Princess Mildred. So you can see the clown nose on the tail. And this is my self-portrait of that version. So you can tell it's me because of the, of the socks that the wolf is wearing. Which led me to um, the personification of animals and how, you know, like we as people tie uh, meaning into these animals. So this is Ai Weiwei's circle of animals that are based on the Chinese zodiac. So I made these vases that are the Chinese zodiac. You know, you're the snake, you're the dragon. But then I wanted to bring those into a Mexican zodiac. So uh, instead of the year of the dragon, it was the year of El Quetzalcoatl. And instead of the year of the rat, it was the year of El Chapulín, and so forth. Um, so I made 12 animals that correlated to the Chinese zodiac that were specific to uh, Mexico. And this is. Uh, my gallery and I presenting them at the Seattle Art Fair in 2018. So you get a sense of the scale. And I've made uh, four different versions. This is the second version that is the Alebrijes at the University of Washington. This is the third version, which is in Metallico, which is closer to the Ai Weiwei representation of these animals. 
And I'm working on a, the fifth version. The fourth one is Talavera, which I don't have documented. And the fifth one is a collaboration with 14 different artists, including myself, um, that each finish one of the heads that is, um, correlates to the year of their birth. So that's what I'm working on currently. Um, Reflect and Gather is this uh, project that I worked on with the community <clears throat> in and around Seattle. And uh, these three organizations, Mad Art, Clay Art Center, and Mudtark Studios in Portland. And I invited people to my studio to come make tiles. Uh, and, you know, I taught them all how to make the tiles. We made them, we fired them. My assistant, Liz, who you can see there leading, uh, leading charge, explained to people how to paint the tiles. So we had groups from high school students to um, retirement homes come into the space and just like, helped me make eventually 6,000 of these tiles. And this is my good friend, Gustavo Martinez, who's one of, going to be one of the artists in the Mexican series who helped me build out um, some rooms. And the idea behind this show was um, to gather in this plaza, in this little communal space, and then to be able to enter one of these reflection rooms and think about why uh, we gathered around communities, some of the conversations. This is the interior of one of those rooms. So it was fully decorated on the floor, the ceiling, the walls. You could be engulfed by ornamentation. Um, and again, I wanted to provide a space where you could go and you can be with people in the plaza, but then like spend time to digest and reflect uh, and think about things. And one of the rooms was this kind of live wet clay room um, that was blank to begin with. And as more people walked into the space, they could manipulate a little bit of clay, leave their imprints, leave a message. And as more people participated, um, the room became more and more activated. <clears throat> this is my uh, Mexican American Gothic uh, with some of those tiles behind it. So merging the, the sanctuary and the reflection rooms. And I just have a few more images here with, um, I did move to uh, Philadelphia just uh, August of last year. And this is the first body of work that I created in Philadelphia, which are my Urban Guardian series. These Urban Guardians, I created a large scale rat and pigeon. Um, and for me, living in an urban environment, the rat and the pigeon symbolize um, these entities that are ever present and very important, but are sometimes looked at as, um, you know, like intrusive. And sometimes, you know, if we personify them, uh, it could mean so many different things. So I wanted to give them a regal standing of these like larger than life guardian figures. And alongside those figures, I wanted people, I wanted to give people the opportunity to make their own guardians and create their own uh, figures. So I made a series of these headless um, bodies that um, where participants could interchange the heads that would fit on them. So uh, Chola, Ancestor, Bedouin, all mean different things and they all will feel different on that rat body. Um, and so will uh, the Luchador Blue Demon, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these heads were somewhat interchangeable. So depending on your mood, you really could um, pick and choose like how you were feeling that day. Um, and then um, this was back in, uh, that previous show was back in August and currently I have this show at the Clay Studio in Philadelphia where I created an altar uh, space using those tiles from uh, the Reflect and Gather. So La Flor, El Nicho y Sus Memorias um, are kind of a culmination of this altar space where I'm hoping that people will participate. This is how I, the process of just like attaching them. but people were encouraged to come through, enter the space, be, uh, you know, we're all social distancing at this point. So one or two people could come into the gallery at a time, but you could take a little bit of clay, one of these skulls and leave an offering. And again, the more um, people come through, we realize that we're not alone. Like there are other people that are still kind of you know, that we're going through all of this together and we are part of a community. So that was my thought behind this piece. I wanted to create
create an altar for a community to come through and leave their, leave their trace, leave their memory, and um, be seen, even if they're not physically together, they could be seen by um, what is left behind. Whew, that was a lot. Um, you know, thank you so much um, for, you know, sitting through the slideshow. Um, and I think that's it from this part. So I'm going to stop my share. So we do have a few uh, questions from the audience. Um, the first few will be um, about the medium of clay. Uh, the first question is, what is your favorite part of working with clay as opposed to other mediums? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I feel like the first um, or the reason I fell in love with clay initially, again, I tried out, you know, I've tried painting and love that for its own reasons. But um, for those of us that have worked in clay, like the tactility of it is so wonderful. You really are using, uh, you know, you're leaving your imprints, you're uh, leaving your touch. So for me, that was something that just attracted me initially. And then the challenge of it, I, you know, I showed that one piece that just fell down and was broken, but that really happened so much. So there's always a challenge of like, how can I make this thing successful? And I really thrive on that challenge of trying to get things um, right. Like, you know, the engineering portion, the, uh, the timing portion. So um, that's one thing I really love about clay. I am exploring bronze casting glass casting um, so there's i always like want to know more about process and materials um, but clay has been a language where i've been able to say um, what i want to say so yes the next question actually deals with this idea of um, the failure that can possibly happen how do you remain optimis optimistic when dealing with failures during a project yeah, so, um, you know, I've learned to, I work fairly quickly. So I'm a, you know, I'm fairly fast builder. Um, so even when a project, you know, a sculpture that I'm working on, <clears throat> if I can take it, usually if I can get past the first few steps, I've gotten better now with more practice that I know what to expect. But um, I know that I, everything can just be like rebuilt. Like even a finished, completely finished piece, I could drop it and it would just break because ceramic is that kind of material where it, you know, it'll shatter if I break it. So I just know that if I made it once, I can do it again. Um, so there is hope in that. Um, and yeah, I guess I'm not like, I love the work that I make, but I'm not so attached to it where failure is, um, you know, Failure is just part of the part of the process, and I teach, so I always tell my students like things are um, like the work you make is great, but don't you know it's not precious. Like it's not something that is really vital to you as a human because the vital part is the creation, not the finished um, object. Thank you. Um, question here: Do you make uh, functional objects ever, um, or, or are they purely decorative or displayed art objects? How do you want viewers to keep your art? Yeah, um, I do make some functional work sometimes. It's not, you know, like I've made cups, I've made bowls, uh, but primarily I um, make sculpture and like wall wall pieces. So I think of even wall sculpture as like a painting. So um, I want some of the, some of the pieces are, you know, they're larger than life. So they're um, difficult to be around. We only have so much space. Like I can't fit all these pieces in my apartment. They're, it's crazy. Uh, I can't go up and down stairs with 200 pound sculptures, but, <clears throat> but I do love being around objects. So um, I, you know, do make some functional work that I, is usable and my home is filled with cups that, friends have made and being a ceramic artist, I can make some cups and trade. And that's one of the currencies that we express affection and love. Um, but also just like, I want people to feel comfortable around artwork. Um, so with the work where you're interchanging the heads, like 
Um, again, it's precious, but I want the viewer, the audience to just feel comfortable living around uh, objects. And, you know, it's just as important to me to have beautiful things around that I admire. Yeah. Next question is actually, uh, it says, first, hi from Chile. It is so inspiring to see how your work has evolved through time. Your work explores stories that are rooted in, cu rooted in culture, place, and identity. In regard to that, my question is if language per se also plays or not a role in your work. Um, it, it does. Um, you know, like when I, when I'm using cultures that are outside of my upbringing, so, you know, outside of the Mexican culture, which I feel, um, very tied into, um, or outside of American culture, which I also feel very tied into. So if I'm looking at something that's, um, again, outside of my culture, and I'll just use like Thai culture as an example, um, I want to make sure that I'm doing the appropriate amount of research and I'm using symbolism in the proper way and not, I'm not, um, uh, what's the word? Like I'm just, you know, being sincere and proper in the way that I use things that I don't, um, that aren't necessarily part of me, but I want to, you know, use to express uh, an emotion or a feeling or an idea. Um, so as of late, a lot of my titling has been in, in Spanish um, as well as English. So I'm, I'm bi very bilingual. Uh, I grew up speaking Spanish in the home. So uh, Spanish plays a big part into the way I want to relate things with um, I had a show recently at the Haley Ford Museum and there's a big Spanish speaking uh, population so we made an effort that every title um, and every description was like both in English and Spanish so that uh, you know a lot of the a lot of what I was trying to say was speaking directly to that community. So we wanted to make sure that it was also being able to translate in, in Spanish. So I do think about specifically English and Spanish as the language to communicate my own, my own artwork. Wonderful. Um, the next question is, I'm interested in how growing up with seven sisters has influenced the, create, the decorative quality of your work. I also want to know how you decided on the scale of your figures. They seem to be ins inspired by folk art figurines, but they are much bigger in scale. Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, four sisters, four older sisters. So seven is a lot more. Uh, so four older sisters with, um, you know, and my mother and my aunt. So a lot of women uh, away around uh, where I grew up, which was so wonderful and such a blessing. And I can really attribute to it molding me to the human I am now. Um, but I would say that in regards to decoration, my, you know, the way that my mother worked with her hands um, really influenced some of the ornamentation and decoration that I use, specifically in the, in the dresses that she would create. Um, I'm sure that there's some things in the ways my sisters dressed um, or carried themselves that have influenced me. But I, you know, like, I would just say that the Mexican culture, like being around supermarkets and being around the city and just kind of like feeling colors and feeling uh, sounds, like that part I try to infuse into my artwork. And in regards to scale, I want, I want a viewer when they approach my work to feel, I want my work to feel like they're in the same space as the viewer. So. You know, if something is on a, on a pedestal, you're going to approach it in a different way than if you approach something that's standing on the same ground that you're walking on. Um, maybe it's a little bit more cautious, maybe it's with a little trepidation, uh, but there is something about like when things can be at your eye level that you see them differently. Um, so most of my figures don't look, you know, you're not gonna mistake them for an actual human. Uh, there's that figurine quality to it, that folk quality to it, but they do inhabit the space. So if you catch them from your periphery, it, it does seem like an entity or a body until you uh, explore it. And I really, I really love that quality. Great. Uh, the next question is, <clears throat> thank you for sharing. Your work has been really inspiring and engaging to learn about. 
One of the problems that I have run into making large scale work is always the factor of funds. How did you learn about managing the economic side of artistry, grants, stipends, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I want to move into uh, bronze work, but that's so expensive. Um, luckily, clay is a very inexpensive material um, for the most part. So, or relative inexpensive, I guess, to whom. But um, like I apply to as much funding as I can. And, you know, sometimes there's funding specific to the city where you live or funding for the practice that you work in. Uh, but then there's these like overall grants. So I spent a good portion of my time applying for things and then getting rejection letters and then making a note of that application so that I could apply the next year and the following year. And eventually things start to kind of like land. Um, I've been fortunate enough to build relationships with um, some collectors that have bought my work and that allows me to just make more work. So I teach as well. Um, I've worked at a lot of part-time jobs. So for me, making artwork is, um, is my career and my profession, but I also, you know, have to survive and make money. So whenever I have more money than is required to pay my rent and feed myself, I'll try and invest that into my artwork. And, you know, this collaboration with 13 other uh, Mexican, Chicano, Chicane, Chicanex artists. Um, a lot of that I'm starting to fundraise for and apply for grants. And um, I want to make sure that all these artists are paid. So there's also some like out of pocket income that if I sell a sculpture, I'll make sure that it gets funneled to these artists that I want to now like support and uh, showcase. So it's difficult. It's never easy. Wonderful. I, I do really love that you are able to sort of amplify other artists within your own work. And um, the next question is, uh, is it difficult to get people to interact with your interactive pieces? And do you ever get inspiration from what participants do? And if so, how do you portray that in your own work? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I, it's not that difficult to get people to, <laughs> to interact. Um, I think a lot of people want to, you know, like as, as soon as they know they can, a lot of people like want to take the, the effort. I think uh, for that altar um, currently at the Clay Studio, I did make one little uh, figure and just placed it. And that is a key that, oh, I can, I can do this, right? If nobody tells you there's, a, there's like a signifier that this is a, the thing that you can partake in, so, um, so I don't, I don't usually have a, a problem with people like engaging and interacting. <clears throat> and I would say there have been, there have been points and it's more, it happens more through conversations than through actual like visualization of the way that people participate. But, you know, I like to talk to anybody that comes through a space and just like get their thoughts and um, they'll share their opinions and they'll, a lot of people will tell me what to do next. They'll just like give me their opinion and say, oh, you should do this, this, this. And, you know, I'll take all of it and I'll use whatever I feel is um, pertinent to the ideas that I want to put forth. So I always appreciate feedback um, and I always want to, you know, include what the community and what the participants have to have to say about the work. So this is our last question. Uh, I think it's a short one. Um, uh, what is the longest time you have spent on a series? Um, the longest time, you know, so it's, it's a great question. Um, usually when I start a series, let's say like the George series, um, I spent probably eight months to a year like making uh, and thinking about, sometimes it's not the physical making, but thinking about those works. Um, but then when I show it in the grouping, then I'm already thinking of the other series. And for the Georges, there's like a whole list of other Georges that I want to make. But then I'm also like, momentum is taking me to the next body of work. So there's always these other things that I want to uh, work on. The Mexican Zodiac, which was one of the uh, like easier series because it's such a it's a parameter that's been set before me. You know, there's only 12 animals. Um, I've been working on that for about three years because there's five different versions and the collaboration with these artists is what's taken longest 
because it's more about organizing, not just myself, but, um, you know, trying to do the outreach to find people and then um, get them the pieces, get them to come to my studio. And it's even harder now where we can't easily do that. George, this is Karen. Thank you for this presentation, this kind of tour through your um, practice as an artist and the significance of your family. Um, you and I had a brief conversation uh, a couple days ago, and one of the things that came up, which I thought was so interesting, especially since you've now been in different parts of the US, how does your work get viewed possibly differently depending on where it's shown? How does the environment affect, um, do you think, how the work is seen? Yeah, so um, I would say that, um, let's see here. Um, yeah, my work in regards to, you know, I've shown my pieces in uh, Seattle where I made my home for about 12 years. And then, there we go. Thank you. Um, so I'm, uh, I've shown my work in Seattle where I've made my home for about 12 years. And I've shown my work in uh, El Paso and like the same body of work. And especially for the sanctuary figures, I, you know, Seattle's a fairly liberal city. Um, so I had a wonderful community come and experience those pieces. But then I was wondering, like, how does the border community of El Paso, how will they uh, accept the same work? And um, it's definitely viewed differently. Um, I can't say exactly like what the differences are, but, um, you know, different communities focus on different aspects of the, of the work. I feel like the, the gathering around the work was really important in El Paso, where um, I grew up and there was something about like having multiple people come through and like walking through that border, um, the, the Katrina and Uncle Sam, like that was really important, where then Uncle Sam took on a different meaning away from the border. Like I, I feel like I noticed that more. I don't know if people like quite understood that portion of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And tell me a little bit about now that you are not able to travel. Um, what is inspiring you? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's been it's been difficult, but I feel like trying to find ways to still maintain that connection. Like I really thrive on the connection with people and conversations. Uh, and, you know, as much as I dislike social media and, you know, um, all of that time in front of a screen, it also allows for um, easy connection. So I've found that via Instagram and via uh, Zoom and all of these other platforms, like I've been able to see a bunch of people that I really admire and then have conversations, probably more conversations than I've had in the past with uh, friends because we can easily find time to hop on the screen. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And lastly, my question for you is, do you consider your work political when you are reimagining a piece like the Grant Wood American Gothic and calling it the Mexican American Gothic? What, you know, does it, what kind of a gesture is that for you? Um, yeah, I definitely um, see my work as political. I, you know, if you would have asked me in early 2016, I might have not, I would have just said it's about only about community. But now, um, you know, me as a brown person, uh, as a Mexican, like, you know, I've kind of been thrust into a political spotlight. So if I make work that's self-referential, that's going to be received in a certain way. So um, I would definitely say that my work is political and with that Mexican American Gothic, it really was about, um, you know, now everybody knows like the word essential workers, but it was about that uh, before the pandemic hit, just like, mm -hmm. how do we keep, you know, how do we treat and look at people that keep uh, this country going? So. And that makes complete sense. Um... And I'm so glad that you said yes, because sometimes artists demure a little bit and say, not really, but um, 
And it's done, I think your work is done in such an affirmative way too, in such a, a way that is really um, honoring. And, and I love that expression that you've given to putting um, culture and peoples on pedestals, both uh, uh, figuratively, but then also literally. So George, I wanna thank you. This is the bonus of uh, Zoom to have the opportunity to um, bring you to LMU, to have the students meet you, to have the wider community meet you in LA. Um, I hope this is not the only time that you'll be in LA and I look forward to continuing to uh, know about your work and about you. So thank you. Thank you to everyone behind the scenes today on Kaleido LA. And I look forward to seeing you in two weeks for the October 23rd talk with the artist John Bankston. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.